Hello and welcome everyone to the 28th seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation seminar series. My name is Kira Shiggins and I'm a post postdoctoral research fellow here at the Aphasia CRE and co-facilitator of this seminar series. Firstly, we would like to acknowledge that this event and the participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend this respect to First Nations people online with us today. Today, I am absolutely delighted that we are joined by Aphasia CRE's own Dr. Brooke Ryan, who is presenting on family focused management of people with aphasia who have children. Before we go into the formal introductions, let's briefly cover some housekeeping. As this is an online seminar, please be patient with us and the technology. Our apologies in advance if there are any disruptions to your viewing during this seminar. Please use the question and answer function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen to ask Dr. Ryan any questions. You can enter these at any time throughout the presentation. You will also be able to see questions asked by other audience members like or upvote a question to show those of most interest to the group. Dr. Ryan will answer as many questions as time will allow at the end of the presentation. Please reserve this Q&A space for questions only and please keep them brief. And also please engage with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. Feel free to tweet along throughout the presentation using the hashtag AphasiaCRE. This seminar is being recorded and we will be able and you will be able to access these recordings along with past webinar videos via the aphasia CRE website. Just click on the resources tab. Videos are usually uploaded two weeks after the presentation. We would also like to acknowledge that unfortunately many people globally are still facing difficult and uncertain times due to COVID-19. A reminder that the CRE has developed a repository of aphasia friendly COVID-19 resources, which are also available on the resources tab of the aphasia CRE website. These resources have been sourced from across the world and you are welcome to use these in your practice. Finally, if you haven't already done so, please join us as a member of the aphasia CRE by joining our community of practice. We welcome people with aphasia, family members, friends, health professionals, organizations, and researchers. Benefits to members include a regular newsletter, updates about events and activities, contributions to research, networking opportunities, and more. The aphasia CRE is also um, always looking for financial support. If you wish to donate, please see our website for details. And now, it is my absolute privilege and honor to introduce my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Brooke Ryan. Brooke is a speech pathologist and affiliate postdoctoral researcher for the Aphasia CRE and was the postdoctoral fellow for the Optimizing Mental Health and Wellbeing program of the CRE led by Professor Ian Nebon. She has also held research positions at both the University of Queensland and the University of Technology, Sydney. Brooke has published over 30 articles and is a chief investigator on two major grants from the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, including Communication Connect, Improving Long-Term Communication and Mental Health Outcomes Following Stroke and Brain Injury, and Implementation of the Comprehensive High-Dose Aphasia Treatment, better known as CHAT. Brooke's research is at the forefront of translational research to meet the mental health needs of those with communication disorder after stroke. Brooke's current work seeks to improve stroke rehabilitation so that it better addresses family and parenting needs. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Ryan with us today to present her seminar on family focused management of people with aphasia who have had children. Thank you so much for being with us today, Brooke. And without further ado, I would like to pass over to you to do your CRE seminar. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much, Kira. It's such a privilege to be here today. I'll just get my screen share up.
So as many of you know, this topic is an area um, that is of huge importance and that I am passionate about. And so um, it is situated uh, in the background of young stroke and stroke in young adults and particularly people under the age of 50 years is estimated to represent 10 to 15 percent of all strokes. And many young stroke survivors of this age group are likely to be parents and have children living at home. While we don't know the exact prevalence of um, stroke survivors who are parents, a study in 2015 um, looked at consecutive stroke admissions and found that of 338 admissions, 18% were parents and had children under the age of 15, uh, 18 years. So we can imagine that young stroke survivors do face unique and extensive challenges, especially with parenting and family functioning due to the life stage that they are in. So when we think about family functioning after stroke, we can imagine the sudden onset of stroke and particularly aphasia can lead to increased stress, poor mental health. And we do know that the impacts um, can be on everyone, including children. And we know that particularly stress is high when the parent of stroke is the main income earner and there are multiple children in the family. We also know, however, that the effect of stroke and an aphasia on the survivor as a parent and on children is largely underestimated. So we really do need a lot more research in this area to fully understand the extent of the impact of stroke and both aphasia. So my work and of, and so, um, of colleagues in the last sort of five years has been working in this area of young stroke and parenting and has focused particularly on aphasia after stroke. And we've conducted three studies which I'd like to talk to you about today. The first study which I'll go over is a case study um, which really highlighted the need for this area. I'll then move on to a second study, a survey of speech pathology current practice in this area, before finally um, an online focus group study with people and with aphasia and their family members that we ran. So with a particular focus on our case study, um, this case study really highlighted for me the impact that stroke and aphasia can have on a family unit um, that has children, especially young children. And this has been published as a conference abstract. So I had the privilege of interviewing Annette, who was a stroke survivor and person with aphasia at three years after her stroke. She had mild, moderate aphasia, um, non-fluid, and was nine, 39 at the time of the interview. She had a son, Arlo, who was five years at the time of her stroke event, and was aged eight at the time of the interview. And her mother, Onnan, um, to Arlo was age 68 and she moved to live in the household immediately following Annette's stroke event. So we talked to each of these um, individuals individually um, and considered the impact of stroke as a family unit. So we talked to both Annette and Trish and asked questions about um, the impact of stroke and aphasia on family and parenting. But we also had the privilege to talk to Arlo um, about the impact of stroke and aphasia on him and what it was like living um, after aphasia and stroke. So these were some examples of interview questions that we asked them. And from this study, there were four main themes that really highlighted to me the impact of aphasia and stroke on a family unit. And so we do have an understanding um, that there is trauma anxiety around the impact of stroke on a person themselves. But what was really highlighted was the trauma and anxiety around the stroke event on the family unit, and in particular, Arlo, who witnessed the stroke. And there was a huge family response in response to this stroke, and it started a new timeline for this family. And there was very limited health professional support involved, and particularly um, when Annette, a single mother living with aphasia, had real trouble advocating for family-centred care and advocating for support for Arlo, which led to a longer term impact. So I'll just take a look at these themes a little bit more in depth. 
So you can see from Arlo's perspective, he describes that when he woke up and he saw his mum in the shower and lying down, that was really scary. And he, some three years after the event, he'd still describe that as the most scariest part. And both his nan had realised the impact of finding his mum in the shower and how it deeply affected him. And they noticed um, that did, that did change him and described him as having a changed personality and potentially not as outgoing and being more guarded. And Annette, Annette herself recognised that because um, her son was the one who found her in the shower, it really was difficult for him and that the fact that she had aphasia also made it difficult to advocate for services. And so Trish, the man, talked about experiences that she thought that Arlo would really benefit from early psychology and especially having help during that early hospital period. Um, Annette and both Trish spoke about receiving very little information about what to do with um, a family-centred approach and especially resources for children. They often turn to looking to the internet for information. So you can see that Annette described that the family focus of care wasn't really there and she wished that counselling and psychological help would be there for all of her family and not just herself. This really did have a long-term impact on Arlo and he described not wanting to talk about um, the event of the stroke and was really scared of a fear that it might happen to other people. So this really highlighted the significant mental impact on children and the broader impact on family. And you can see here, just reiterating this from Annette, that he really, Arlo, as her son, um, some three years after the event, was still talking about the impact of stroke and aphasia. So for me, this case um, really started, I guess, a passion to understand um, how we can better provide family-focused management for people with stroke, and especially those with aphasia who have children. So that led us to a survey study to try and understand what was our current practice in this area. And it, particularly as a speech pathologist, I was interested in what speech pathologists are currently um, doing in terms of family-centred care and practice with children. So this is a second study that I'd like to talk to you about that's been published um, with my colleagues and lead author, Kirstine Shropshaw. So what we did was we, um, we conducted an online survey study and participants were eligible if they were a current speech pathologist working in Australia in the area of adult acquired communication disability. We had a total of 76 responses and included 53 in our analysis. So a completion rate of about 70%. And of the people who conduct, um, completed this survey, the majority were female aged between 20 to 39 um, and had over five years working experience. And their predominant caseload was working in inpatient rehabilitation and they described aphasia as being their dominant communication um, caseload. And from that survey, we learnt that over 80% of speech pathologists reported that they had seen parents with an acquired communication disability who had children under the age of 18 in the past 12 months. However, more than 75% rarely provided information, education or counselling services to the children of those parents who had acquired communication disability. We also found, however, that 75% indicated there was a need to improve the services provided to children of parents with acquired communication disability. And we took a theoretical perspective to try and understand what were the barriers and facilitators to this care. And we found that opportunity barriers um, were identified most, um, including limited access to children in therapy sessions and a lack of resourcing, funding and time. However, there was a lot of barriers in providing services um, in a family focused manner and particularly um, targeting children. So this really highlighted to me from these findings is that there is potential to provide family focused care to um, during rehabilitation, particularly for people with stroke and aphasia. However, it's unlikely 
um, that our health services are currently serving this population. We would like to improve family focused practice, but we really need to better understand family functioning from both the perspective of family units, including their children and clinicians, and as well as consider the many, many barriers and facilitators to optimal care. So that led us to study number three, to try and really understand the patient perspective and family unit perspective a little bit more in depth. And so prior to this um, online focus group study, it was prior to COVID-19 and we were trying to really identify a, what, identify a way, a methodology in which to reach a hard to reach population. Um, because often, um, as we found out from our survey study, people are not presenting as family units in rehabilitation and it was really difficult to access children. So we came up with an online focus group study, um, which I'll talk through now. So it was a qualitative studies as design that had a phenomenological approach to understand lived experiences. And we recruited internationally on social media platforms. And participants took part in focus groups using the Facebook platform. And we felt through this platform, um, we would be able to identify um, families, um, particularly young people who had strokes and their spouses, um, because social network um, is quite active. And it would be a way for participants to engage in our study uh, at a time that was convenient for them. So we do know that Facebook groups are excuse me, increasingly being used as a source of data collection. And as I mentioned before, they have the benefit of being in synchronous real time or in asynchronous manner over time. It's useful for hard to reach participants. It can provide a sense of anonymity, provide time for reflection, convenient engagement without geographical time barriers. And there is some support in terms of communication support um, in multimodal responses, so allowing text responses, photos to be uploaded, videos and GIFs. Although I do acknowledge that um, there are a lot of barriers to accessing social media for people with aphasia. So what we did is we ran two focus groups where we posed questions. Um, and these are examples of the questions. So we're wanting to find out what family like, life was like and what people did together, how families cope with the impact of aphasia, how aphasia has impacted parenting and how things have changed after stroke and aphasia and particularly what support and resources people needed. We ran two groups, one for parents with aphasia and one for family members. So they were in separate groups. The groups were open for eight weeks and they were moderated by two speech pathologists and a final year um, speech pathology student. On most participant posts, we asked follow-up questions, clarifying questions, and encouraged discussion among group members. So participants did need to be of at least 18 years of age, identify as a person with aphasia or family member of a person with aphasia who was living in the same household at the time of the stroke onset. They needed to have children or dependents under the age of 18 at the time of stroke and aphasia and be at least six months post-stroke. So we did exclude family members of a person with aphasia um, who were not directly involved in parenting and anyone who was unable to participate in our Facebook group due to the methodology or technology. However, we did try to provide a lot of support in terms of aphasia-friendly material to help people get online and to interact um, with the technology. So we had 11 people with aphasia and their family members who were parents to 23 children. Five participants um, with aphasia were in one group, um, most of which were female, most came from Australia, four were married and were living with a spouse and two children in their own home. And you can see here um, that most people were under 40 or 50 years old. And on average, people were eight years post onset of their stroke and aphasia. But we did have a range from um, the six month mark to 18 years. Our second focus group had six family members who were six females um, from a, 
Australia, United States and Canada. Um, again, most people were young and under 44 years old and they were spouses and um, one mother who was um, living in the same household with her daughter. They were parents to 23 children collectively. Um, so the children didn't participate in the study, but I thought I'd profile um, their demographics here so you can have an understanding of the household unit. And on average, the children were eight years old at the time of the study, um, from a range though of six months old up to 18 years. And just for those who are interested, because we were using a sort of novel medium to collect this data, I've totaled the number of responses given in the discussion group from the participants with aphasia and the number of words that were used in our data analysis. So you can see we had did have some people contribute um, a lot of responses, so 16 in-depth responses, um, versus people who um, didn't contribute written responses as much, but were certainly liking things and um, commenting more briefly on other people's posts to say they concur with what was being written. So just something to think about if using this medium in um, the future. So I'll walk you through the results of the people with aphasia group first before moving on to family members. Um, their themes were quite similar um, and four themes were identified from the focus groups with people with aphasia. So I'll walk through those now. So what we saw from the focus groups was that people with aphasia really had a fractured parent identity. So stroke and aphasia rehabilitation really did impact on all participants' ability to be a parent. So people spoke about both positive and negative experiences, but also the impact of stroke being sudden and fracturing either um, their identity of a parent either before, of what they knew before their stroke and after. And bonding and attachment was really impacted for younger children. People described missing out on their child's life, and this was common regardless of the age. And you can see a comment there from a person with aphasia saying, after discharge from my speech, um, after discharge, my speech and mobility were poor, and so the relationship with my son was skewed more to my wife. Participants talked about um, difficulty with parenting, especially during the transition period, and as children grew older. So um, one participant, had her stroke quite early on and had been parenting with aphasia and stroke for 18 years. So she talked a lot about the transition from schools, um, primary school to high school and major transitions in um, her son's life. And she spoke about it being particularly difficult at the school environment. And she wondered if um, she didn't have a stroke, what it'd be like with, to identify as being a school mum, being able to do the reading days and tuck shops. So those activities that really heavily relied on communication and relationships. And other people spoke about struggling with help with homework, spelling, maths, and instructions with complex ideas and words. And often people talked about the ineffective communication um, really contributing to a breakdown of spouse and parent-child relationships. It's particularly through um, really complex times um, when children are growing up in those transitions. And as people grow older and communication requires more complex um, skills and negotiation, advice, counselling, coaching of our children. So as a result of this um, difficulty, parenting often led to frustration, anger, shame, self-doubt, worried and low mood. People said, said things like not being the mum I should have been, aphasia being tiring, emotionally draining, frustrating, and feeling that they haven't done enough. In saying that though, um, the flip side, children are a very motivating factor for recovery and return to independence in parental roles. So participants really described that their biggest motivation and their drive was being able to smash their therapy, um, to be able to return to active parenting and relationships and family functioning. And people had positive experience when engaging in therapy with children. Um, so giving examples of reading books together, learning alphabet together, counting together. So including child focused um, rehabilitation tasks um, was really important. 
There was also a sense of acceptance and maintaining a positive attitude and pressing on despite challenging times. So someone mentions, I cope because I have to. Moving forward is the only way to get through it and hopefully get past it. So there was a range of different practical and emotional supports that were provided to the participants with aphasia. Um, however, they it was on a continuum. So some people felt that their parenting and family needs had been addressed during rehabilitation, whereas others felt it was neglected. Um, but people said that it was really important um, in order to fulfill family responsibilities and return to normal family functioning. So people said that the support system of other family members and friends were really important, including support from other families with children, particularly grandparents um, of people um, were key and critical. And a lot of grandparents helped out with parenting tasks. Participants also commented on the importance of salient and functional therapy tasks that related to parenting and most often reading tasks. And that the most effective treatment um, was including children in therapy and give an example of being able to read out loud. Just, um, their son was an example. And often reading um, out loud was commented on a lot about being really helpful. So turning to family members now, um, as I mentioned before, the themes were quite similar um, and I'll walk you through those now, but from a family member's perspective. So family members really mentioned about how um, as a result of, of stroke and aphasia, it changed how families actively participated in life together. So someone described from um, going from a family who used to be super active um, to a family that goes on long drives, that they were unable to be as flexible as prior to stroke um, in terms of what activities and engagement they could do with their family. Often people did speak about the lost childhood um, and that was a real area of loss um, for families and avoidance of activities, especially those that um, may be difficult um, from a perspective of communication wise or difficult from a family organisation point of view. But someone described, I remember not deciding to go to a school trivia night um, just because of the frustration of aphasia and being able to know the answer but not being able to get it out quickly. So family activities were impacted. There was a sense of loss of shared parental roles, especially those parenting tasks that required communication. And most of the burden of parenting and um, family functioning shifted to the spouses or guardians. And someone described that overnight, I basically became a single parent and full-time caregiver. So often things as supervision, discipline and teaching that was once shared roles were mainly impacted, but also play and enjoyment. So one participant said aphasia has bit tremendously affected um, parenting. He was incredibly hands-on dad, um, helping most nights at bed nights, reading stories and making up silly puns for their four-year-old. But the aphasia, being able to talk, read or write, um, changed those activities. And now the parenting time is now just snuggling and watching videos together. And they were really important still to have that connection and time with those activities that were once um, communication focused had changed. Often spouses um, commented on the loss and grief of their spouse, um, who they once were, and their role as a father or mother. So someone um, described, sometimes I do feel widowed and wish that the outside world could understand that. It's so strange to constantly be mourning the loss of a spouse who is physically still here. So that real sense of identity and family functioning and parenting was lost. And the impact of aphasia and stroke on um, communication, someone described that they um, keep their communication to a minimum and they miss having their husband or partner to talk to. And this often resulted um, with a lot of emotional difficulties such as frustration, anger, shame, self-doubt, worry and low mood as well, particularly for spouses and commenting also on the depression in people with aphasia. A specific problem um, which I would like to mention is the impact of fatigue, emotional regulation and anger that um, commonly noise that family members highlighted and the impact of that on, impact, on their interactions with children. Um, 
So often people described as a result of stroke, um, the person with aphasia had difficulty participating in activities that were noisy. And so it was often hard, um, particularly because children are noisy, um, to interact. And this had a real impact on interactions. And so as someone said, oh, it's always hard because the noise causes headaches and children are noisy. They, and the person with aphasia felt powerless and out of control, leading to a lot of anger um, and in this instant profanity towards children. And so that sense of um, emotional regulation, noise and overwhelm did come through a lot in the focus groups and being upset um, with the children and because of the noise and mess, um, leading to an avoidance of activity. Again, there was a sense of trauma. So um, for the another child who witnessed um, the stroke event, suffering from post-traumatic stress um, syndrome that had been diagnosed and the child had been receiving support for. And spouses really commented on an inability to then also have sufficient self-care. Um, so someone said, nowadays I'm embarrassed to admit I like to eat dinner away from the rest of my family and will even let the kids watch videos while they eat so I can get time away and feeling guilty for that. And so um, a lot of people did really highlight that it was really important to seek psychological and support and counselling um, for spouses in the context of family needs. Again, spouses um, described that it was really important to have individualised support. Again, though, there was a variety, um, a sort of a spectrum of involvement of families within rehabilitation. So some people and their families were highly engaged and set therapy tasks with their children in stroke, whereas others um, were not so much involved. And a lot, were, a lot of people mentioned that advocacy was required. Um, so they told us many rehabilitation professionals would include our children, but no one really took the lead to that. So there was a um, caring sort of responsibility placed on children, however, when involved in rehabilitation. And there was a sense of this burden and um, continuum of burden placed on children. So um, different health professionals approached to how children were involved slightly differently and the role of children in rehabilitation. So spouses commented things on um, whether they rehabilitation professionals paid support in terms of information and counselling directly to children or involved children um, to help out with care needs and um, almost becoming young carers. So one participant said, I remember being really annoyed with a nurse in rehab saying, you're going to have to help mummy and daddy when he gets home. And they didn't, the spouse really didn't want that to take place. So we were seeing a lot of differences if children were involved in rehabilitation, how they were involved. And spouses said as a result, it was really important that counselling, couples therapy and trauma support were needed and finding that the right therapist um, was key. And to help with this, um, and a lot of family functioning after stroke, it was really important for technology um, to support parenting and family functioning efforts. So using things like electronic calendars, reminders and audio books. In particular, um, with regards to speech pathology intervention, um, again, we saw a, a difference in whether speech pathologists approach parenting and family focused needs. So one participant said um, his SLPs did high quality therapy and considered work needs, but I'm not even sure they knew how to approach parenting needs. Another participant said that it was really important um, to have education and communication support for children, um, in particular communication partner training, and it particularly a strength and competence based approach um, in educating children. Participants wanted, um, as I mentioned, ideas for speech therapy about how to engage in non-communication activities. So give me an example of a helpful story um, that you might have on an audio book was an example or playing board games, um, like trouble with few words or watching a movie. So really highlighting the importance of non-communication activities for that engagement and re relationships. In particular to communication strategies, um, it was participants and spouses said it was really important to focus on um, the relationship 
highlight areas of competence and strength-based strength perspective and non-verbal communication. So they said it's a balance trying to get them to look at um, the person with aphasia as a parent, as the boss, but also being able to support that communication. So I think um, that's an area we really need to focus on in the future is how to get communication partner training and support family functioning with a balance of roles, both as a parent, but also trying to engage children in communication partner training. So overall, from my um, three studies that we've conducted today, I think the key findings are that parents with stroke and aphasia face significant stressful post-stroke adjustment challenges, that families are in dire need of resources and support for their children, and that the burden falls heavily on spouses to maintain strong family functioning with limited input from stroke health professionals and services. I think the key message is that relationship and psychological focused care for families is really vital. And there might be a variety of ways in which we can do that as multidisciplinary teams. And we do really need to understand what is involved in that a little bit more. But at this stage, I think as health professionals and particularly speech pathologists, we should be open to the meaningful involvement of children in stroke and aphasia rehabilitation. And we do need to better understand what that may look like. A perspective that we might consider in our rehabilitation is rehabilitation with a parenting focus and starting to bring out some of the literature from psychology and positive parenting. And in particular, one example is the Triple P um, that was developed at the University of Queensland. And this has been particularly important, especially during COVID times, um, in knowing how to talk to children about stressful and traumatic events. And so I think we can draw a lot of literature from um, positive parenting programs about how we can engage with children around traumatic events such as stroke and build positive relationships. So of course, um, all of these studies have limitations and it's really important to acknowledge that the sample sizes that for these are small and that we need to really um, look at our gender diversity for the, our participants and the majority of our participants um, with aphasia were male and their spouses were female. So we do need to consider gender diversity and cultural diversity within um, our family focused care. And a key limitation to date has been that missing children and multi-team disciplinary, multi disciplinary team perspective. And so these are all limitations that I'm hoping to work on in the future. Thank you so much, Kira. Wow, thank you so much for that presentation, Brooke. I think um, a lot of us on this call will feel that that was an extremely emotional topic and that it's, it's extremely profound. Um, I think we're very privileged that those who participated in your studies were so honest and open with what they shared about their experience. And I think that really, um, yeah, was, was um, really beautiful to see and the way you portrayed it um, was just stunning. So thank you so much for that, Brooke. Um, we have a few questions here for you now. Um, and I'm just going to start with one from Professor Miranda Rose. Um, she asks, are you using a particular model of family functioning to inform your research? Um, not at the moment. So that's something that I'd like to really work on. Um, so we're establishing partnerships with child youth and mental health specialists. Um, so bridging the collaboration with speech pathology and psychology um, is really important. Um, and we have a grant at the moment, um, which hopefully may be successful to learn about what might be the best model of family functioning and how we can better collaborate. Yeah. Brilliant. And I, I hope that gets up so that you're able to explore this a little bit more because it's such an important topic. Um, we have one from Edwina um, and she, uh, sorry, Edwina Lamborn, and she says, um, the impact of a parent with aphasia on children is fascinating. We know that aphasia is a specific language disability and not a reflection of intelligence or competence. I wonder what children's understanding of aphasia is and how this impacts their perception of their parents. Do you have any insights on this from your research? Sounds, I'm just, could you repeat exactly the question, Kira? Sorry. I think you're asking um, what do children know about aphasia and how do they perceive that yeah. from their parents? Yeah. I, thought, yeah, I wonder what can, children's understanding of aphasia is and how this impacts their perception of their parents. Do you have any insights on this from your research? Um, that's one thing that 
I think we need to investigate further and it's certainly a limitation of our studies to date is that missing child voice and I think um, I think it's going to, my gut tells me that it's going to be very depending on the age of the child mm. and um, the experience that they've had in rehab and I think that's something that certainly we need to start thinking about is how we can best co-design um, age appropriate resources including children to understand um, better what they need um, in terms of information and support. Certainly from a parent's perspective I know that they would like information in a strengths based way so not anatomy, not understanding the deficit of aphasia but more a family focus so how they can better move forward as a family. But certainly children's perspective and child psychology and child youth mental health is something that I'm hoping to bridge. Yeah that's a brilliant point that um, yeah focusing on the strengths rather than the deficits that a person has is so important especially when um, a child is developing that view of their parent. You, you know as a parent you don't want them to think that you're not competent or that you're not intelligent and um, another interesting thing you said there is about the age and how that um, would need to adapt, how any intervention would need to adapt as the child grew um, and got older and how the, the, the things that they need to be dealt with change. Um, we have a question here from Ruth Lewis. Are there any existing resources for this area or is it a really, sorry, or is it really new? A lot hasn't been developed yet. Um, in terms of resources for children, there are a couple um, which I can include um, on my slides and put on the CRE website. So mm -hmm. there are books targeted at uh, what is aphasia and um, what does this mean for my mum or dad? But certainly it's very limited in terms of describing aphasia from what I've found. Um, I think Deb's posting in the um, chat some specific resources. I think what's key though um, from the interviews and family group focus groups that I've done so far is that we individualise those yeah. and that we focus those um, to the specific needs of the family. I can't imagine that any um, sort of one-off resource is really going to address the needs. Um, there's certainly strategies available um, that we could implement through the parenting programs, um, guidance over how much to talk with children, um, whether too much or too little, mm -hmm. um, being guided by children, but certainly individualisation and attending to what is the priority of the family would be key. Yeah, yeah. that's so important. And, um, yeah, as you said, even if those resources do say what a phage is, they might not have that strengths based perspective that you said that the parents are looking for as well. Um, we've got a question here from Rebecca Hallou. Um, can our current evidence based parent management training, psychological therapies be, sorry, the chat's popping up here at the same time. <laughs> um, sorry, can our current evidence based parent management training, psychological therapies be tailored for people with aphasia? What other elements would these treatments need to address for people with aphasia and their family members? Uh, Rebecca, that's my exact next research question. Um, so I don't think we have the answer to that. Um, I think that's a key research question that we need to answer. I can certainly see um, that they can be tailored, but um, I think we need a co-design approach and a bridging um, between the psychology and speech pathology field, um, whether that be training for speech pathologists in parenting programs, um, co-design with parents about how to adapt these resources and what specific strategies. I imagine that we do need something quite specific and tailored um, to the stroke and aphasia though, um, while incorporating that broader literature. Yeah, so those those other resources would be on parenting more generally, would they, Brooke? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've not found anything, um, apart, aside from fact sheets, um, which are great, um, put out by the Stroke Foundation about how you might talk with children or parent, and, um, but nothing really in terms of in-depth parenting programs mm -hmm. I'm aware of, yeah. And something, as you said, um, that intersection between what we do as speech and language pathologists, but also what psychologists can bring to this, because um, it seems from your case as well, there's a lot of coming through around PTSD and trauma that um, would really need that interdisciplinary approach to any anything that we would do. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to see if we've got any other questions. So we don't have any other questions coming through. I just want to make sure that I haven't missed any on the chat. No, but 
Deb has put up some resources there from everyone. And um, what I was particularly fascinated was that um, I think you said in one of your slides that eighty percent um, of people with aphasia that speech therapists had seen in your project um, had children under eighteen, and yet I think it said that seventy five percent did not offer. Um, any parenting support or any intervention relating to parenting for those people. Um, so I just found that that was quite a fascinating figure. Um, could you go in a little bit more into some of the barriers um, that those therapists were experiencing and maybe why they didn't address this topic? Yeah, so um, again, small sample size limitation, so disclosure, <laughs> disclaimer about that. Um, but most of our speech pathologists were working in a quiet communication caseload and it was upon their reflection that they had people on their caseload in the past 12 months who were parents. So they identified them as having children. And so that question really just asked them, did they provide information or did they provide counselling and support? Um, so we found out that 75% didn't provide any information to children or child specific information. So um, didn't provide a pamphlet about aphasia. Um, and then beyond that, people didn't engage in counseling specific roles or parenting specific focus. Um, so 75% again, didn't provide that counseling focus. And so some of the barriers that were identified, um, there were quite a few, but it yeah. was essentially around opportunity. Um, so you can imagine families are quite busy, um, the sudden stroke and onset events, so that opportunity to actually get people into therapy, actually see children and present as part of the rehabilitation team. Um, that was multi-layered, so whether that be practical or whether that be um, parents um, with aphasia and stroke and their family members' wishes, so often there was a protection, so an unsureness about mm -hmm. whether to include children in rehab. Um, but essentially it was about opportunity and then also resources. Um, so knowing what resources are out there, what um, could be tailored and also confidence. So is this even my role and what can I be doing about it? So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area about um, our role as speech pathologists um, and then training support and resources to um, be able to adequately service families. Yeah. Yeah, and it is quite a difficult one because you shared that quote from um, one of your participants where they said that they were actually quite upset that the, that the I don't know whether it was a speech pathologist or a nurse had said to the child, you need to help your mum and dad when you get home. So, you know, there is kind of fine line there between, um, you know, commenting to children or saying what children should do or shouldn't do um, in response to stroke. So, you know, building people's confidence around that would be really, really beneficial. Um, yeah. Do you think that the, like anything that you would develop could also have application to other people in the family? So maybe grandparents or grandchildren, grandparent relationships? Definitely. And um, I guess family systems theory says that each family is unique. And um, so that's why I would really encourage an ind individual approach because people do have different roles in family. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think there's a laid approach needed here, a sort of foundational sort of resource level where it might be appropriate for any sort of parent with aphasia and stroke and their grandparents um, and their role in the family. Um, but I think it's something that individualising to the family and the role people have in that family would be key. Yeah. yeah so I know grandparents may have a parenting role or they may not. Um, so that's where I think part of what we need to understand is how can we best provide a service to families and how can we best tailor that? Yeah, yeah. so that would be um, like you're saying that practical and emotional support that people are looking for. So some of the practical stuff may be more around, um, around what is aphasia, but then maybe tailoring that as well, as well as the emotional support. Is that what you me. Yeah, so tailoring. So, for instance, if we take like communication activities and um, whose role is it in the family to read a bedtime story? Just one example. Um, yeah. So, who's in those active parenting communication roles? And that's going to be different across any family. So, you might provide communication partner training depending on that. Um, or, um, uh, yeah, just depending on people's family dynamics, that's where you could tailor 
um, your communication partner stra strategies, um, your communication therapies around communication tasks or non-communication tasks to create that engagement and relationship. That's amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, we've had a question come through here from John Pierce. Um, he said, a lot of that was heartbreaking to hear, but so important. Um, what would you do on this area with unlimited resources? That's a good question. With unlimited resources. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back to this again, co-design interventions. So okay. from critical stakeholders, so um, family members, um, parents, children, but also multidisciplinary team members. So I'd love to work on this from a multidisciplinary perspective. So psychologists, speech pathologists, OT, physical therapists, um, OTs, um, to really identify what are some current, com current or common parenting and family focused needs and to be able to address this within our stroke rehab. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I think that's key, isn't it? Getting all of those involved and the key stakeholders around a table and seeing how we can best serve them, but also learning from our um, interdisciplinary colleagues as well, especially with, you know, the fact that we do need those practical, but also emotional supports in there as well. Um, I'm conscious that someone in the audience, Charlotte, is raising their hand. Um, unfortunately, we can't turn on a microphone, but if you have a question, would you be able to pop it in the Q&A box for us? And um, please, Charlotte, as I'm afraid we were not able to turn on the mic in this webinar. Um, while we wait for Catherine's or Charlotte's uh, question to come through, I was just wondering, do you see um, any intervention that you do develop? Would that be like with the whole family together, with the family system, or do you think it would be with the parents individually and then the, the children individually? Um, as I'm sure that there's different things that would need to be addressed for each stakeholder group. It's something I've thought about a lot, um, and I don't think we have the answer. Um, I think a multiple perspective um, we need to consider. So I think I imagine, um, I always go back to the preferences of family. So I talk to them first about what they would want. So yeah. who would they want? Um, I do know um, we need to be really mindful of child and youth mental health here. Um, and it, if we were to do any research further with children, we'd have guidance around that because um, talking to children about traumatic events, stroke, um, it's a really sensitive area and talking too much or too little with children can be harmful. Um, so I think there's a number of considerations um, there, but ultimately um, going back to a multi-perspective co-design um, with people with aphasia, key stakeholders, services and MD team. <laughs> That's my yeah. key message. Yeah. And I am, um, I just had a thought there just from a research perspective, you know, because you are wanting to work with children, is that something that's, that's, that's um, a barrier or, or, um, you know, would they also be involved in the co-design aspects? Um, so I've worked with children before, but not yeah. in a aphasia and stroke related field. Um, so co-design with children is certainly an area that is possible, um, particularly in child youth and mental health services, um, yeah. digital mental health services. And so that area of co-design with children um, is possible and ethical. Um, it's just being mindful of the needs of that group. And so, so research with children, I think is critical. Yeah, it's just doing it in the right way with the right team members. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, then also maybe getting support on that, on like what what to ask and how what's too much to ask as well. Um, and yeah. this is an incredible um piece of work, Brooke. And I imagine that it's gonna be um yeah, something that will keep you keep you researching for quite a quite a few years to come. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really lovely to see in today's seminar how this program of research has built from that initial case study, um, to you know your work with the healthcare professionals and then actually getting a little bit more um, from people with aphasia themselves. So it really has been a program of research that's developed beautifully, um, and I'm really excited to see where those next steps go and how this develops. Um, in the future. Um, I just want to check to see if we have any other questions. We don't. Um, any final comments that you would like to make on this topic, Brooke? Um, no, just thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm very open to collaborations and working. I think this is an area of real need and um, real gap. And we have a lot of questions rather than answers. So yeah. um, it's a big space to be working in. And, and, and as we said, because 
parenting goes on for such a long time of a child's life, you know, and the, the, those needs will change over the course of, of that child and that parenting relationship. There's just so much that can be done and would need to be adapted for that family. And also families are so complex. So I can really see that this would be a really complex intervention to develop. And um, so I wish you the best of luck with anything that you do in this area, Brooke. And um, yeah, well done for, for taking this on and for actually addressing this huge issue that's so important for people with aphasia, for family members, um, but also for our role as speech pathologists, because communication is at the heart of any parenting relationship. And um, so thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you. Oh, sorry. We actually one quite more question has just popped in. <laughs> I thought like, I was hooked up. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I've done a nice little roundup, and now I've actually got one more. But just um, sorry, one more from Ruth Lewis. Um, said in your conversations with clients, have you identified common family communication activities that are really important to people, like book book reading, that someone who doesn't have kids could use as a starting point of what to ask the families about in order to get an initial idea of what is important to them? It's a great question, Ruth. <laughs> Fantastic question. Um, so homework, it depends on the age of the children. So from our Facebook study, most of the children were um, school age, I believe. Um, so any school age activities, so reading, homework, um, basic math activities, um, literacy activities, were therapy focused activities from a communication and rehabilitation perspective. But families were also wanting ideas um, about non-communication activities to build those relationships and those engagements. Um, so I think it's about having a discussion, what people do as a family um, and how we can build both communication and non-communication activities um, from a rehabilitation perspective, but also from, also from an engagement and relationships perspective. That's an excellent point, isn't it? We can address the communication aspect and those activities, but also if those are a bit more difficult for people, we need to have something else that they can build that connection yeah. with their children as well. Um, thank you so much, Brooke. This has been really wonderful. And just to say that Charlotte hit the hand by accident, so that's why <laughs> you put it in yeah. there. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I just want to share with everyone. Um, so we are very lucky that for our next CRE seminar, um, we are going to be fortunate enough to welcome Professor Linda Worrell, um, who will present on aphasia access, action success knowledge, which is better known um, as the ASK study. Professor Worrell will outline what the ASK study tells us about preventing depression in aphasia. This seminar will take place on November, or sorry, in, sorry, this seminar will take place on the 23rd of February. Please join our community of practice or follow us on Twitter to find out further details about this seminar. And now before we end this seminar series for the year, um, all of us at the Aphasia CRE would like to wish you and yours happy holidays and best wishes for 2022. Thank you all for your participation in our seminar today and for supporting the seminar series and the Aphasia CRE throughout the year. And most of all, thank you to you, Brooke, um, for this wonderful presentation and for um, being with us today. That was a really excellent talk. Thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you.